encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. Conversations about life, Christianity, and culture. Welcome in. This is Four Preachers in a Podcast. I'm Robert Hatfield. There's Brad McNutt from Moulton, Alabama. Hey, Brad. Hey, how you doing? Hiram Kemp, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Hey, Hiram. Hey, how's it going? Very well. Chance Hicks comes to us from sunny Charleston, South Carolina. Hey, Chance. Hello. How are you guys? I think we're doing great. Today, we're talking about creating culture. We're in that part of our cycle, and uh, to do uh, the, the culture that we're trying to create is biblical hospitality. Chance, you've got the uh, steering wheel for this episode. Take it away. Great. <laughs> All right. Uh, looking forward to our conversation today about biblical hospitality. And like Robert said, you know, this is an episode about um, creating culture, about developing the right kind of uh, atmosphere amongst the congregation where we are, the right atmosphere uh, amongst those who are Christians as we follow Jesus. And so today, centering on uh, being a congregation and a people of hospitality. Um, I think most of us, I think the four of us in this podcast, uh, grew up in the South. And so hospitality is one of those terms uh, that's often tied with um, Southern culture. Um, you have Southern things like sweet tea, you go above the Mason Dixon line and you ask for sweet tea and people look at you like you're crazy. Uh, it's a Southern thing. Bold peanuts are a Southern thing. A lot of times hospitality is considered a Southern thing. And so you go into a congregation in the South and you might be uh, greeted uh, with warmness and welcome. Uh, but we want to do, we want to be a congregation and a people of hospitality, not just because it's a Southern thing, uh, but because it's a biblical thing. And so that's where I want us to start in our conversation today. You know, what are some passages in uh, the scriptures, particularly the New Testament, uh, that teach us to be a people of hospitality. Um, if we're creating biblical culture uh, in the church, then what's the biblical foundation for us to say we need to be a people of hospitality? Um, so we want to do that because of the teaching of Jesus and because of the teaching of Scripture, uh, not just because we're good Southerners. Uh, we want to do that because we want to be good followers of Jesus. And so where would you guys direct us as we think about biblical passages that teach us to be hospitable? Uh, the first thing I would say is I'm from Florida, not the South, but I don't know. If <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Scott's no. fired. <laughs> no, that, I guess that is the South in some ways, but Romans 12, 13 would be a good place to start. Um, in Romans 12, 13, Paul's talking about the transformed life and the sacrificial life that we live. And he says, contribute to the needs of the saints and be given to hospitality or to show hospitality. And so this is a part of who we are because our minds renewed and we're living sacrifice. And it's just one of those passages in the chunk of text with a lot of imperatives and things that describe how we should live and who we should be. And in the midst of all of this blessing and persecution talk of Romans 12, this one may get passed over, but it's just as important to make sure that we sh take care of one another. And part of that involves showing hospitality. Yeah, and that, that passage in Romans 12 is in a section that's about um, some general teaching and wide application. You know, he's not Paul's not talking there to one specific group like he would in like, uh, the book of First Timothy or in Titus, where he's talking directly to those men who would serve as elders and giving hospitality or being hospitable as one of the qualifications. When you get to Romans 12, you're looking at a general biblical principle for those who are followers of Jesus. And he says, this is how we all should live. Uh, people, the New King James says, given to the SV that we were looking at there says seek. And that's a term that, that has to do with uh, pursuing or pressing toward. And so, you know, not waiting until someone kind of urges you to be hospitable towards them, but you're the one, the first one moving in that direction uh, to show this kind of, of spirit. All right, any other passages you guys want to bring up? I tend to think um, <clears throat> a little bit more maybe in, in Old Testament uh, terminology. I mean, there are several other New Testament passages, and I'm sure they'll be uh, discussed here in a minute. Um uh, you look at the at Old Testament. I mean, you you see Abraham's interaction with the angels in Genesis 18. Of course, he's not aware of that at the moment. Uh, it just kind of shows you his hospitality. Um, also, there was a strong Jewish concept. Hospitality was considered one of the highest virtues um, in that particular culture. And uh, 
so there there are tons of passages even looking at the way god fed them in the wilderness was considered uh, you know an act of hospitality that he delivered them and then he gave them the homeland and um several other things and so for me a lot of that uh, is rooted in the nature of god um and so there are several Old Testament passages, and, and even, you know, when Jesus talks about heaven, he compares it to what we consider not necessarily solely hospitality, but part of hospitality, and that is the banquet table or sitting around and sharing the meal together. People come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, and the sons of this age will be cast into outer darkness. They'll be on the outside of the feast. So those are some of the texts that I think of with hospitality. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, Chance, when you think about, like Brad was saying, the Old Testament, it's interesting. In Genesis 18, uh, Abraham shows hospitality, and then God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But in Genesis 19, Lot is rescued. And sometimes people say, why is Lot rescued? He doesn't seem like the most noble guy. And while Second Peter says some things about it, it's interesting the parallel of hospitality that mm -hmm. Lot shows in Genesis 19. And I think that's the biblical evidence that Lot is a righteous guy. He's doing just what Abraham did. Um, one more New Testament passage would be Hebrews 13 and verse 2, where he's saying, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for by this, some have entertained angels unaware. And so this idea, this encouragement, I don't believe Hebrews 13, two is saying when we extend hospitality, we're going to meet an angel. But I think it is getting the idea across that great things happen beyond what we might imagine when we extend hospitality and notice exhibit a now who he's talking about in Hebrews 13, two is up for discussion. It could be Abraham, could be Lot, It could even be Manoah and Judges 13, because mm -hmm. there have been other individuals who have been welcoming and it ended up being an angel or divine representation or something like that. But the encouragement for Christians in that passage is show hospitality. And again, it's connected with brotherly love, much like Romans 12, 13. And when you do this, you never know what good will come from it. Yeah. And the instruction there in um, Hebrews 13 is do not neglect it. Or I think the new King James says, do not forget, um, you know, so don't let this be uh, one of the traits that you kind of let fall out of your mind or, or let fall to the side or that you lose focus on, like keep this at the forefront of your mind. You're pursuing this first and foremost, um, being this, um, people who are hospitable, um, willing to, willing to share, willing to help others. Robert, you got any passage you want to add to this discussion? Yeah. I was just thinking about first Peter four. And again, you've got the, the, the link there about loving one another earnestly in first Peter four, eight. And then in verse nine, he says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling which is interesting. So, you know, don't, <laughs> don't be put out by it. Uh, and I was just thinking too, I mean, the Hebrews 13, I know first Peter four, you know, the passage I've just raised seems to be more in a, in a brotherly kind of context focused inwardly, that is within the community of Christians, but Hebrews 13 and, and these other places that we've noted, you guys have noted Genesis 18 and 19 as well. You know, the emphasis is I'm, I'm willing at least to be hospitable to anybody, you know, even if that person Hebrews 13 too says is a complete stranger, uh, so yeah. this is just a sort of a way of life. It's just what I do. Yeah, I think it ties to an earlier episode we had too, as we were talking about the golden rule, you know, treating others the way we want to be treated. Matthew seven twelve, you know, considering their situation and then doing for them what we would want them to do for us. And so uh, this this kind of culture of hospitality plays into that. I think it's interesting in those three New Testament passages, right? Romans twelve thirteen, Hebrews thirteen two, First Peter four nine all of them that are directing us to show hospitality or be hospitable each give you a really a kind of a different um, thought about it. One says, you know, press toward it or seek it. One says, don't neglect it. And the other one says, do it without grumbling uh, or, or without complaining. Uh, so it kind of gives you a, a full picture, a full concept of what it should look like as we are uh, people of hospitality. Other passages, I think, that fall into this in the New Testament, you have some demonstrations of it. Uh, Philemon, verse 22 uh, Paul's writing to Philemon, and he's requesting there in that passage Philemon's guest room. And I think that's probably implication that Philemon is known for, uh, being one who is hospitable. And so Paul says, at that at the same time, prepare a guest room for me. Uh, so he's hoping to come and see him, and he 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 recognizes in Philemon uh, the love Philemon has for the brethren, the love that Philemon has for God's people, that Philemon has this spirit where he's going to be willing to open up his home. Uh, then you go to uh, 3 John or 3 John, and you have Gaius, and um, he's one who's recognized as open his ho opening his home for traveling Christians uh, to receive them and then sending them on their way. And so you have these great, um, not only the Old Testament um, 
examples that we referenced, but these New Testament saints um, who are demonstrating this great spirit of hospitality. All right, so with the, that foundational uh, background with those passages that call, it, call us not to forget it, to pursue it, to do it without grumbling and complaining, let's, let's ask the question, what is this hospitality that we're talking about? What, what does the Bible mean when it says show hospitality or seek to be hospitable? What's that, what's that mean? I would say that the word hospitality means um, it really just deals with loving strangers in a lot of contexts. I believe it appears five times in the New Testament, but it's it's a welcoming spirit. It's this inviting aspect. But Hebrews 13, two helps with this background on what, what's being discussed. But it's really the love and the welcome of strangers and to care about other individuals that are on the outside and to manifest that by welcoming them. Typically, this involves the welcome into the home of somebody or something along those lines. But and this is where I think biblical hospitality supersedes this cultural Southern hospitality because it's more than just being nice and cordial in the foyer. It's about a welcoming and an inviting into, you know, sort of your personal space and just really loving the strangers. I think you see that in third John, but also in the other passages that tell us to do this with each other. What came to my mind, and, and I thought of another example or two while we were sitting there, was uh, 1 Kings 17, the widow at Zarephath, and 2 Kings 4, uh, the Shunammite woman who prepared a special room for Elisha, of course, each of those, one for Elijah, one for Elisha. And um, the special relationship that they had, it's just a, a, a disposition. It's a, it's a characteristic and uh, a description of a person's heart that says, I want to make people feel welcome. I want to make people feel comfortable. I'm willing to be inconvenienced um, in order to make you feel welcome. Um, that may not be the best terminology, but you know, uh, you know what I mean by the inconvenience of it. I mean, <clears throat> When, when you have someone in your home, someone who's staying in your home or something, you, there are things that are, are that are changed and are shifted and uh, you can't do necessarily everything that you might would uh, on a normal day, but uh, you're willing to and, and to absorb the cost of that. Um, you know, when someone's staying in my home, no, you don't need to bring your own food to eat or uh, or something to drink. We're we're going to take care of all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, but really, all of that is just a disposition that says, "I want you to feel welcome and valued," and this is a way I can do that. Yeah, it's about that spirit of of generosity and that spirit of giving. And so, in that way, it's a reflection of the nature and character of God, who is uh, by disposition a giver of good gifts to uh, his people, but also a giver of good gifts to his creation. And so it's learning to be uh, open and welcoming um, and being generous in what we have. You know, I guess in the scriptures and in that early first century culture, it often included lodging strangers or lodging guests or lodging travelers. And so you have some, some translations that use terms like entertain strangers, uh, where more modern translations use the term uh, hospitality or being hospitable, but like a, a willingness to to open your house and use it as a place of lodging for someone that you didn't know. And so you, I think you have that in Third John, where he's opening his home to um, traveling preachers, people who are who are going to to share the gospel, and he's giving them a place to stay. Uh, probably, as you mentioned, providing food. Um, but in in modern culture, you know, hospitality isn't limited to opening your house for someone to sleep or for someone to spend the night. And even in, in biblical culture, uh, it wasn't limited just to a, a guest room uh, for a night or two. You think about if, if Hebrews 13, 2, um, where it talks about entertaining angels, let's suppose for a minute that's a reference back to Abraham, which is a possibility, which would take you to Genesis 18. Well, although the text says that um, he entertained angels and he showed hospitality in Genesis 18, it doesn't appear that they spent the night there, but what did he do? Like everything that he did for them was a, a demonstration of hospitality, although he wasn't lodging them in his home. So he's sitting there in his tent in the heat of the day, enjoying the cool, and he sees these three strangers approaching, and he immediately jumps up. He runs out and greets them. He invites them to his tent. He invites them to, to the shade that he's enjoying. Uh, he 
goes quickly to bring water and to wash their feet, to give them rest under the tree. He's going to provide them a meal from what he has. And so he's giving them a morsel of bread and he gives them uh, milk and um, butter. And he's going to go and have a calf prepared. And so he's he's giving them everything that he has in his possession that he can use for uh, their benefit, for their betterment. They've been traveling. They're tired. They're hot and sweaty from walking. And he says, here's my shade. Come sit with me. Uh, and even if that meant Abraham has to sit in the sun so they can sit in the shade, you know, he's willing to give of what he has. And maybe that's one of the, the best definitions of hospitality is this just a generous opening of the home, of the hands, of whatever we have to use what's in our possession for the good and benefit of another. And so it might be our home, but it might be our car, or it might be our checkbook, or it might be uh, our pantry, but just opening whatever we have when we have the opportunity to to minister into the life of someone else. Yeah, Chance, and as you were talking, I'm, I'm just thinking about a pattern that seems to emerge in um, – in the Bible when people extend hospitality. And one of the things is, is very sporadic. A lot of times Abraham didn't get a lot of notice beforehand. I'm not sure that Martha did in Luke 10 with Jesus coming to Bethany to her house and yet they were able and ready to do it. And so it doesn't always involve a big production and it's more than an event It's not hospitality in the Bible. Isn't really about, I mean, you can have scheduled meals and that sort of thing, but it's once it becomes a way of life, Romans chapter 12, the life of the living sacrifice. And of course, there are times when we're better positioned to do this than when we're not. But when it becomes a part of who we are, when the opportunity presents itself and the need is there, we just do what Abraham did and exercise it. And it seems that this is what Gaius was doing as well, because John says, you're looking after these folks, strangers though they are, and your fellow worker and your fellow helper, and you should do this sort of thing for them. And so it just seems like a lot of times in the Bible, it didn't involve staying the night all the time, but it was also sporadic on occasion where things just happened and people acted fast and said, Hey, I didn't expect to see you at worship today. So to speak, we would say today, but come on over and let's just have something to drink and just chill out. It doesn't have to be a big production all the time. Wait, 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 wait. So you're saying this isn't a program. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's not a, I don't see that in the new Testament. Like, and I organized efforts are good, but sometimes organic efforts are also needed and helpful. And if we don't learn how to do that, we'll be frozen by, wait, we didn't have a committee meeting on how to be hospitable instead of just you're a Christian, just do the natural thing and help people. Yeah, the, yeah, the organic nature allows you to meet that opportunity right when it comes. Sometimes the, the program nature says, well, wait a minute, we, we got to wait until we can schedule you into the program and then we'll get to you. But being organic lets you in that moment take advantage of an opportunity that you might not have again. Another door like this may not be open, so... Uh, flexibility there um, to engage in that ministry. Yeah, to me, the, the, the concept of stewardship plays into this. Uh, you know, just the idea of I will feel as though I am empowered to give of the things that I have when I look, when I view correctly the things that I have. <laughs> you know, the, this idea that I've been blessed so that I can bless others. Uh, you know, Paul appeals uh, to the Corinthians, uh, about the, the example of, you know, others and in second Corinthians chapters eight and nine. And, you know, he basically says that, right. God has blessed you so that you can bless somebody else. And so, you know, when I'm on the lookout for ways, not that I can pile up more or feel as though I have to really guard and protect everything I have, but instead, you know, ways that I can implement. And that doesn't always have to mean writing a check. Um, you know, we're going to eat. I'm sure that we could probably, you know, spread this meal out to cover another plate or two. Or, you know, I, I, I'm going to be going to worship anyway. Can I come and pick you up? Or, you know, uh, we're going to the park. Does another family want to to join us. I mean, I don't know if all of this would be textbook hospitality, but it's that it's that spirit of it. It's that inclusion and I'm going to welcome you or we're at the park and we see someone who is clearly in need or or whatever. I mean, it's it's this this notion of I have what I have so that I can use it to bless others because ultimately I I have what I have to use it for the master's use. And you know, I'm just going in my mind, I'm just sort of everywhere, but I'm thinking like parable of talents, you know, and 
here's this master and he gives five and, and three and one or what is five and three and one. Is that right? Five and two and one, five and two and one. It all depends on your translation. <laughs> However you count it. This is my brain today. Uh, so anyway, you got the five and the two and the one and uh, you know, the master owned the original and the master owned the increase. And he came back and wanted to settle up for it all. And, you know, the issue with the one talent guy, and we've preached it forever. It's not that he was a one talent guy. It was that he remained a one talent guy. He didn't do anything mm -hmm. with the stuff that he had. So we got to think about the stuff that we have. And I think sometimes we overcomplicate hospitality because we think, well, I don't have a lot. Well, you've got what you've got. And, we're, you know, we're supposed to use the things that we have to glorify God. And so hospitality enables us to do that. And really, was, hospitality is a heart disposition. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not just the action. It's the heart behind it. Because um, I mean, if we limit Abraham's hospitality to Genesis 18, I think we miss it. Uh, because you have a generous giving spirit in Abraham much earlier than that. You go back to Genesis 13, and suddenly there is this strife between Abraham and his herdsmen and Lot and his herdsmen, and how are we going to handle it? And we're brethren. And so Abraham has this generous giving spirit. Then here's this land that God's giving to him and his descendants. And he says, okay, Lot, you pick first. You choose which way you want to go. Mm -hmm. And so he lets Lot have the allotment of land that's going to be given to him, and he he's willing to let Lot have that, and he's going to go a different direction. Um, so you, you have that generous giving spirit in Abraham long before Genesis 18. Uh, it's that heart then that continues to flow in, in, in and through his life. I think it's interesting to see the varied individuals that practice hospitality. Like this isn't a male thing or a female thing. You look at Abraham, but then you've got Lydia in Acts 16, and then you've got elders. I know people sometimes say, well, that qualification is there because their wives are going to help them. Well, Abraham says, yeah, that's a part of it, but men can extend hospitality as well. And the fact that Lydia, two things, Robert says something about desire. Acts 16, after she's baptized, she compels Paul and Silas and Timothy. Like she wants them to be there. And I think it's interesting that she's a new convert when she does this. How much Bible does she know? Well, she's a seller of purple. She has means. She has materials and she just wants to do the next right thing and help these guys that are taught of the gospel. So hospitality is for you if you're a man or a woman. Hospitality is for you if you're rich or poor. And it's for you if you've been a seasoned Christian or a new Christian. You read about Abraham and others. And maybe there are people in our congregation that really they just really soar. They've got a big house, a lot of land, a lot of stuff. And we might put hospitality in like the elite lane. Like if you can only do it on this scale, but folks like Lydia and others show us, it doesn't matter if you're a brand new Christian, you can do this. This isn't a hack per se. This isn't a, you know, I guess it's not necessarily a spiritual gift unique to any one Christian. It's just the spirit of Christians in general. How much did Lydia know in Acts 16 that compelled her to be a welcoming and opening person? And it was a base for Paul and others when they were in Philippi, at least for that time. So if you're a new Christian, this is something you probably could do right away. And if you've been a Christian a long time, maybe this is something you've neglected that you can practice. Okay. Can we talk a minute about the elder qualification thing? Because what Hiram said, and I thought, wow, yeah, this is the way, it, at least in my experience, it has been viewed most of the time. Mm. He is to be given the hospitality. That's something his wife will do. Yeah. That's why he needs to be married, because that's a woman thing. Um, <laughs> no, that's not what First Timothy chapter 3 actually says. <laughs> We're talking about him here. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I guess it will be very helpful if she is also given to hospitality, but we're talking about him here for a minute. So, you know, I, we shouldn't just put that off on her. I mean, that this is, yes, he is to be married and no doubt, you know, a woman's perspective and a woman's touch, even though she isn't the elder and she's not in the room and she's not making the decisions in terms of the leadership of the church, the oversight of the church. Right. Uh, so I'm not discounting her her part that she's going to play in that hospitality, whatever it looks like, but it's like, it's on him. <laughs> He's supposed to be the hospitable one. <laughs> and Robert, I think there's a reason for that because yeah. as an elder, you're going to deal with all kinds of folks and you've got to have a welcoming disposition. When stranger Tommy comes up for benevolence help, you don't need to be sizing the guy up like a private investigator. I mean, you need to be wise and you need to be discerning, but if you've got this spirit of skepticism about every individual, 
that's not the welcoming spirit of a leader. If you think, oh, they're going to get the expired green beans in the pantry, you know, we got to be careful. That's the wrong heart. <laughs> he, in said it. he said it. <laughs> and so, like, we're kind of suspect about welcoming people. We're laughing it's like, because it's true. Like, it happens. <laughs> it is. It is. I, I, I don't and think you could have put it in an any better way. That was, <laughs> no. The expired <laughs> green beans. I mean, and we've uh, got this pan- Well, we should we help them or not? Well, an uh, elder has to be welcoming because. You're on the front line of strangers. When right. people come to our building, what do they say? Can I see the pastor or who's in charge here if they want help? And again, there's discretion, there's wisdom, there's stewardship, but he doesn't need to necessarily call his wife and say, hey, can you handle this? That just shows that view of the qualification shows we've limited hospitality to cooking a meal and having somebody in your home that's involved with it. That's the arm extended of somebody that's hospita- hospitable. But hospitality, First Timothy three, Titus one. It's about how you view human beings. How do you view other people? Does this guy have a clear view of other image bearers? And does he welcome even those that he doesn't know in hopes that they'll one day become a potential brother and sister in Christ? And even if they don't, they're still due respect, kindness and generosity. And elders need to have that. And um, we use those examples. We laugh about it. But sometimes it's like, well, that guy's kind of he's a great elder. Boy, he can teach that Bible. He's kind of grumpy. He's not a people person. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's not qualified. We can't let that go like that doesn't go. That doesn't pass. That's not what Paul's saying. Well, a lot of Bible knowledge stands up for the truth, but he's a jerk for Jesus. You know, no, don't go by him. That's not a welcoming spirit. And that's what Paul's getting at in those passages. A stranger will feel comfortable in his presence. He should be welcomed and embraced and he should love to do it. Yeah, and that, that should allow also for the sheep to feel comfortable in his presence, right? That he would be mm-hmm. have a disposition where one of the the members of the congregation where he's serving who might be in a difficulty or struggling with something would feel like he has a spirit that I could go talk to him and he would be understanding and welcoming and would use whatever at, is at his disposal or at the church's disposal disposal for my aid and my benefit that, that I would feel like I could be welcomed into that conversation. Because Can that's the next say, thing. Sorry, Brad, but just interject this really quickly. That's the next thing. You know, almost every week before the contribution, at least at most places where I've ever been, we pray for the elders that they will have wisdom as they distribute the resources of the church. Okay, well, yes, uh, although the elders do not exclusively distribute those resources. I'm hoping the deacons are also distributing some resources and maybe even other key ministry leaders, right? Because the elders aren't paying for the craft supplies in the Bible classes, at least not personally. Mm -hmm. They may sign off on it in the budget, and they should. Okay, so, but how is this guy going to use those resources that we have all pooled together? I mean, we're praying basically that he will be hospitable, right? So there's another aspect to that. Sorry, Brad. No, you're good. I was just going to say, first of all, I love Hiram Kemp unplugged today. And uh, <laughs> he's let loose with the green beans, <laughs> the green beans and the jerk. Um, but anyway, uh, there's another side of this that I think of maybe even like Romans 14 and 15, where you follow the in the ESV, you follow the word welcome, welcome one another, uh, even in differences of judgment on faith. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. And I really think that's the heart of all hospitality. And as we're talking about the way hospitality has many different uh, tentacles, if you want to you know, put it that way, uh, it even applies to matters of Christian liberty and judgment, hospitality. I'm not going to view you as suspect because you do something that's different than I do. Um, I'm, you're my brother, as he says in Romans 14, You'll stand before Christ the same way I will. He's able to hold us and keep us from falling. We're to welcome one another. But at the heart of hospitality in general, the disposition is understanding hospitality we have received at the hand of God. That we have, of all people in the world, been graced with the most wonderful blessing on earth. And trying to show that to people in the world that... You know, God sends his reign on the evil and on the good and makes his sun to rise on the just and on the unjust. And I'm willing to be hospitable and kind to every single person with whom I interact because that's exactly the way I've been treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just trying to imitate that. And that's a disposition of the heart first, Um, as has already been said, that I really understand and feel the weight of what God and Christ has done for me. And it makes me want to show that to other people in any way possible. 
you know, Brett, when you were saying like Romans 14 and stuff, I just thought real quick, if you look at all the passages in the New <clears throat> Testament, hospitable to strangers, hospitable to brethren, like nobody has to qualify with us to be shown hospitality. I think that's the mm. point. Like you don't behave your way into our good graces and then we extend hospitality. <laughs> Are you an image bearer? Boom, you're qualified. That's it. Stranger, whoever you might be, whatever the case may be. Now, I know Second John 9 through 11 talks about this in conjunction with endorsing error and that sort of thing. But that aside, if somebody's a brother in Christ or they're a stranger and we're trying to help somebody, our mindset should be welcome them and receive them. I mean, we praise the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, but what he did was simply practice hospitality. And as much as we love that parable, Jesus doesn't really hold him up as doing anything extraordinary. Jesus is saying he did what anybody should have done if yeah. they want to fulfill Leviticus 19, 18. He really didn't go above and beyond in the mind of Jesus. He says, hey, go and do likewise. And that's startling because we think, man, that would really put me out. That would be a stretch. And Jesus is saying, that's what you, that's the bare minimum. That's the least you could do. Yeah. So with that example, then hospitality is equivalent in definition to showing mercy, right? Jesus asked, well, who, who's the neighbor? And he says, well, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, yep, that's what you go do. You go do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's having that merciful, compassionate heart. And then it, it flows out of us in, in a generosity and kindness toward um, strangers or brethren. Um, and as we've mentioned, you know, it doesn't have to be, this huge thing, I'm thinking about Matthew 10, 42, Jesus said, you give a cup of cold water only in my name. It's like, that's not going to go unnoticed. It's not going to be um, uh, unrecognized by our Father in heaven. So he's going to recognize that spirit of generosity, even if all we can do is say, hey, we've got a bottle of water here. Can, can I give that to you? Would that be of help to you? Um, so it doesn't have to be some, some huge uh, ceremony. Just what do you have? and invest that into the life of another person when they're in need. Honestly, it seems like hospitality itself, like the act of showing hospitality to another is not the hard part. The hard part is developing the humility that you need to have, the sacrificial spirit that you need to have to look at another person and to put their needs above yourself and your own needs and to consider them first and then to treat them the way back to what you said chance earlier about the golden rule treat them the way that you ought to the way that god you know wants you to so the problem is getting over ourselves <laughs> and dethroning ourselves and then we're free to practice hospitality the way that we should it, you know so i may be totally out in the left field here and you know whatever um <clears throat> but <laughs> Brad's out there with the green beans, but it's fine. yeah, expired. I'm expired, expired in the corner with them. Um, but anyway, we love the darkness apparently. But anyway, um, uh, when I think about this and hospitality and being reminded, um, especially with the table image in scripture, um, when we come to communion, when we come to partake of the Lord's Supper. What is that if it's not an act of hospitality, if it's not a reminding of God's hospitable nature to us in that in Christ he gave himself to us? And so that when we sit down and we <clears throat> eat at that table, we're reminding ourselves of, of that experience and letting that be something that propels us forward. Help me to go ahead and, and to even pay that forward. And I mean, if we're talking about even just how to build up in the local church itself, hospitality, you know what I have found? And I think, I don't think I'm the only one that's found this is that you, you meet it, say you move to a new work and you meet people and, you know, you kind of get used to talking to one another at church, but then you have them over say on a Friday night or a Saturday night, and then you walk in the church building the next day and you see them and it's different. It's completely mm -hmm. different now. Like, because we've been in, in one another's homes. And, and so even when you see that person get up, maybe to lead us in the Lord's supper, or you sit next to them, and we partake in the supper, that fellowship is sweeter. Um, it, it's, it, it's a stronger connection. And, um, so I think maybe the Lord's table can be enhanced and we can also learn from each other and, and be propelled from it to practice more hospitality. Um, not saying that's necessarily the, the primary function of the table, but I think it's, it's an element that could be considered. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's right, Brad. And I think when you talk about Jesus, it's important to appreciate what Jesus did at the table and how it affected his interactions with other people. Craig Blomberg wrote this book about contagious holiness, Jesus meals with sinners. And um, he makes some good points about Jesus at the table. And you think about Jesus in John six and in the various passages, all of the miracles Jesus did aren't recorded in all of the gospels, but his feeding of the 5,000 is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And think about all the important conversations Jesus had with people. And a lot of times it was over a meal. Jesus did serious, you know, talking with folks over a meal, John 21, the breakfast with the disciples and just getting people around the table allows them to let their guard down. And Jesus did a lot of preaching and teaching there. When he fed the 4,000 and the 5,000, the disciples were saying, Hey, let them go fend for themselves. And Jesus and his welcoming spirit says, no, they followed me. We need to provide for them. And he does that. And so learning from Jesus in the gospels and seeing what he did around the table provides us with an example on how we need to really do the same thing. And when we get around the table with people, I'm persuaded if we can get them at the table, we get into their hearts and they get into ours. Jesus was able to have serious conversations with Pharisees and disciples alike at a meal. And you can't do that in the foyer shooting past somebody or maybe even at the job. And so. Mm -hmm. We can talk later, I guess, maybe about what hospitality accomplishes. But that's one of the things is it, you know, basically loosens the tension, lightens the guard and allows people to engage with one another in a common way, which is helpful. And yeah, if you want to study, sorry, if ahead, you want to study the table, Luke's gospel has a special emphasis on the table. I mean, it's everywhere and paying attention to whom he will, with whom he will eat, even twice i believe in luke he eats with pharisees who many of the pharisees who are very antagonistic toward him he does not allow he does not create a caricature of them and mistreat them he humanizes them he welcomes them and is welcome into their home and you know re receives hospitality which is a whole different episode in itself learning to be a gracious receiver uh, of the hospitality of other people <clears throat> And, and Hiram kind of steered where I was thinking that this conversation would go next. And, and that is, you know, what, what is accomplished with hospitality in my mind, when, when you open the door, you invite someone in, you, you engage in this spirit of generosity with them and you're welcoming towards them, right? It, it it's a, an opportunity that opens doors for further ministry. It, it allows you to connect with them. It builds a relationship where there's a, a, a more willingness to, to drop down the guards and the walls and the barriers that are put up and to really let someone know what's happening in your life and what's going on and, and maybe even open the door to uh, struggles in someone's life that you weren't aware of, that now you have an opportunity to uh, minister to in prayer or minister to in some other way, some other way of support or encouragement or um, studying the scriptures together. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Hospitality just opens the door for an even greater impact for ministering and carrying the gospel into the lives of other people. Yeah, I think, you know, you could have been at every public sermon Jesus preached, but that wasn't going to allow you to know Jesus better than the disciples because they spent intimate time with him eating and sharing life together. And we can come to every assembly together and be in one another's company, but we just are never going to know each other like we can and like we should until we get past the foyer and into each other's homes. And um, again, beyond just scheduled occurrences of that, which are good and aren't bad in and of themselves. But when that becomes our culture, we talk about pattern theology and I'm good with that. But that's in the book of Acts. And um, this idea that they were in each other's home, that they ate together, that they spent time together it enriched their relationships and it enriched the church. And we need the same thing today. We haven't graduated past the need for that, though our society has changed. And maybe that's part of our problem. But when you get around the table, that's when you can have some of these discussions and build friendships, learn people's hurts, learn people's fears, get to know, get to know where they are and that sort of thing. Yeah. And hospitality, I mean, could just include maybe not inviting you to to the house, but hey, do you want to go to the Mexican restaurant after services and just sitting down with that family yeah. and, and listening and engaging and learning one another. You know, it doesn't have to be in your home. It can be in the local restaurant, McDonald's, or wherever you want to go, mm -hmm. but investing in the life of somebody else. Nothing like Mickey D's. Mm. I used to I get they frustrated. Have good fries. 
Yeah. I used to get frustrated with this in ministry because it, it felt like for me as a preacher, I had a lot of surface level interactions and everywhere I went, I had surface level interactions. So if you go to the funeral home, you know, you got a lot of hi, how are you? And then, you know, you try and connect as much as you can with the family who's grieving and then you move on. If you go to the church building, right, you're trying to make your way and make everybody feel welcome, but it's all a lot of hi, how are you? And it doesn't go any deeper than that. And I'm not saying that the hi, how are you? Aren't good. I think maybe that's a great first step. But it, it, in my mind and personally, I've adopted the phrase meaningful interactions where I'm trying to get a little deeper than the hi, how are you is even initially, if I can, to have as many meaningful interactions as possible, just so people really know that I care and so I can have a better opportunity of listening for their needs that they might have. And, you know, then to carry that into, you know, some maybe Sunday lunch or Sunday dinner or, you know, Tuesday night together or something like that. Uh, but, you know, I had to be more intentional about that. And, and I think a lot of people, whether you're a preacher or not, I think you probably understand a lot of this, especially at church. We see the same people. We do the same things. We're just sort of in the same rat race all the time. And we need to do something to be intentional to get out of that because brotherly love is supposed to continue. <laughs> that means being hospitable to one another. And so, you know, it, it, I, I have a feeling that... It, there was a sense in which a lot of this could have been the case for first century Christians too. I mean, they, they were the same people in the same congregation and, and maybe they didn't have, you know, 30 or 40 year Christians among them at first, but you know, at the same time there, there had to have been some monotony, some routine to the things that they were doing. They had to be intentional about interjecting other things. It's interesting that the writer of Hebrews says that, and I, and we've noted, right, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4. I mean, it's not just the writer of Hebrews, but we know the stuff that was going on that the writer is addressing in the letter to the, you know, to the Hebrews, and, and they're dealing with some things. And so a part of the solution, in addition to the lettuce patch of Hebrews chapter 10, right, let us encourage one another, and, you know, we need to get together. But when we're together, among other things, you know, we need to show brotherly love to one another and be hospitable to one another. So we've got to find a way to break the cycle. And, you know, for me, that just starts with being more intentional about meaningful interactions. And I think for preachers, it's especially important that people understand that you're human, Yep. And that you, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I hear some preachers complain about how they can be viewed and treated. And, and some of that has nothing to do with them. It has to do with previous history that's gone before them. But some of it is the way that they present themselves. They're not open. They're not willing to just be people. They're still trying to put on something. And, and when you welcome people into your home, um, <clears throat> So uh, when people come to our house, sometimes I will, especially because I'm stunned at the amount of people are like, we've, we've never been to, to a preacher's house before. And it's like, okay, well, let me tell you what we're going to do. So for the first 45 minutes, we're going to hold hands and have a Bible study. <laughs> and then for the next hour and a half, we're going to eat around the table. And then we're going to come back and we're going to sing songs around the fire for another 45 minutes. <laughs> and then we're going to have sharing time. And, <laughs> I said, and of course I, I do that now because so many people were like, oh, oh no, what are, what are we doing? I'm like, you're coming to my house. We're like one couple. <laughs> I'll never forget. We were in Kentucky and uh, we were, uh, me and, and the husband in this particular situation, we're talking in the living room and I hear Brooke just start dying laughing in the, uh, in the kitchen. And one of the, uh, this man's wife had, had said to him, okay, let's, let's just cut to it. We, we know you brought us here for a reason. What are we doing wrong? And, and, and what do you want to talk to us about? <laughs> and, and, and You've been called into the it. principal's office. And she was like, we thought you might like to eat. Like that, that's it. Just, uh, just reminding people, like, I want to be your friend. You know, I have been known to go sections and hours at a time without actually talking about the Bible. And that, that's, like that's not a bad thing and um hospitality just kind of is a way to connect and to humanize one one another and to break down that barrier and let people know that you're a real person with struggles and i'm just trying to do life along with it. and honestly i just want to be your friend mm -hmm. that's it 
And Brad, I think that's a big deal. Like with Christians and non-Christians, when we extend hospitality, whether it's at our home, at a restaurant or something, people are people. They're not our little projects, you know, like this isn't like we're going to do the meal to get to the study to, hey, we want to save souls. We want to point people to Jesus who can save souls. It's probably a better way to say that. But the point is, like, you're a person, you're a human being, and I want to show hospitality and kindness to you because I'm an image bearer and you are. Of course, the goal is always to draw closer to people in Christ. But the reason why people feel like, oh, there must be something else behind this is because people just assume in our world and in our culture, you always do something to get something. And we've got to show them Christianity is not that same way. We are not we're not doing something in an effort to like hustle you. Hospitality isn't the divine hustle. It's not a theological hack that gets you in the door to get what you want so that you can. Hey, it may lead to all those good things, but that's really not the thrust of who we are. We're just trying to be the people God wants us to be. And that involves being loving, kind, welcoming and open again with Christians and non-Christians, just getting to know them for who they are. And interestingly enough, when you do that, the rest normally follows. People are going to open up and talk about their lives and all that. But people can smell a scheme coming a mile away. Yep. People aren't stupid, man. They can see what you're setting up and how you're trying to do things. And we just need to not be so predictable and just be loving and trust that we can be that without always having some hidden agenda. If you want to stay to the Bible with somebody, hey, come out and do that. But mm-hmm. like sneaking people in to kind of, I, I just don't know if that's the way Jesus wants us to operate. Hey, that yeah, reminds I mean, me, uh, just while we're together, I, I want to share with y'all about some Tupperware. Um, and, <laughs> and then I also have a, a, a pink drink that I think you'll really like. Is it now a good time? Okay. <clears throat> Perfect, no, timing. Perfect timing. Perfect <laughs> timing. Yeah, I think some of the you know some of those other things are byproducts of of showing hospitality and can open the door for those things, but they're not supposed to be the motivation behind it. And in to me, it's really interesting in those three passages that we highlighted in the New Testament that call us to be that call Christians in general to be people of hospitality: Hebrews thirteen, First Peter four, Romans twelve. And not just in the chapter, but in the immediate context of that command, there is a connection to love that's supposed to be motivating this kind of attitude and this kind of generosity and this kind of behavior. Uh, we're to be um, hospitable, Romans chapter 12, and in that section he says, you love without hypocrisy, and, and he talks about brotherly love. That's Romans twelve nine and Romans twelve ten. In Hebrews 13, it's in verse 1, let brotherly love continue, and then he explains how you demonstrate that brotherly love, but it's love that's motivating that. And then First Peter 4, verse 8 says that we're to have fervent love one for another, and then it's that fervent love that motivates and generates our hospitality. And so that's what's behind what we're doing, right? Just a a genuine love for people and love for others. And so we're willing to open up and we're willing to share. And if that leads to further opportunity, great. And if not, we've demonstrated the loving heart of God through our love for other people. Mm -hmm. So what might stand in the way of us being more hospitable and how do we generate or create this culture as we're bringing things toward an end what are some things that might stand in the way and then how do we encourage this and cultivate it in our lives or in the congregation i think for me it was the worry of i'm going to embarrass myself what if people don't like me if you know, they think I'm strange or weird or or something along those lines, but at some point you have to, and that's me as an introvert, you know, you, you think about those things a lot. And, um, but at some point I had to realize, you know, that's really a backdoor way into just being prideful. Why do, you know, if a person doesn't like me, you know, that's not an excuse to be unkind and, and to be obnoxious and not be socially aware. But at the same time, you know, I, I can't control that. And that should not stop me. If I'm worrying about what other people think about me, it's still about me. It's not about hospitality. And um, <clears throat> for me, that was a barrier that I had to kind of get over that said, okay, I'm willing to, uh, to just forget about myself and focus solely upon this person and even if it's just the hospitality of having a conversation with a person who maybe even clearly doesn't want to have a conversation with you, um, trying to make them feel welcome. So for me, it was about getting out of my own way and saying, okay, you need to get over this. You're still making this about yourself and you need to put the other person at the center of it. Yeah. And I think Robert mentioned this earlier about 
people and like it's about them and not about you. I just want to try to relieve the burden on myself and on anybody else who's listening to this and say one of the things that gets in our way is maybe our obsession with perfection. We feel like if we can't do it the best, then we can't do it at all. Or like, you know, listen, hospitality is about who's at the table, not what's on the table. Mm. And we worry about like, well, we don't have the best this right now. Or maybe our house is being renovated, so we can't do anything at all because we've got a little mess here and there. And maybe there's a time for that. And I get proper timing. But remember the urgency, because when people are in need, like that's when they need you to be hospitable. And a lot of people don't really care if you've got clothes that you've washed that you haven't put up in a basket. Like that's really not, we're so concerned about perception sometimes and we want to put on our best and there's a time for that. And when you're prepared and all, you know, firing on all cylinders, that's great. But when you really do life with other people, you start to realize, Hey man, I'm just passing through. I'm stopping at your family member's house. You don't care if everything's laid out beautifully, your family. And in Christ, hopefully we can get to that point where we're not so worried about keeping up appearances and we don't put pressure on ourselves to have to do everything perfect before we do anything at all. And just remember, hospitality is about the people that are gathered, not so much the gathering itself or what's on our table or how beautiful our house looks or our car. We're sometimes ashamed of our resources. That's what I'm trying to say. And that keeps us from doing what we should. We don't have enough money to take you to five star or our house or our car kind of makes a noise when you get in it. And so. We'd rather not do the good thing than do the good thing and it maybe not be up to some standard that somebody else has. And the car might smell like expired green beans. So, Mm. yeah, I mean, it might. But I really think it all brings us back to what Robert said a while ago, and that is the focus is on ourselves. And when that happens, even in a good place, because I think that comes from a good place, I really want to give this person the best. Mm -hmm. We may be shooting ourselves in the foot because what's your best right now? That's what all Jesus wants you to give. I've known some Christians who struggle with hospitality because of the pro the, the few we ought to say the very few prohibitions in Scripture. I'm thinking like in Second John, you know, especially verse uh, ten. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. And you know, there there's been a lot of confusion and swirling around about you know in First Corinthians chapter five. Kind of hate to bring it up, uh, you know, about the exercise of spiritual discipline and whether you can share a meal with that person. And and the fact is, rather than trying to to really hone in and realize exactly what that text is saying, and we need to remember, okay, we are given divine exceptions to the divine general principles that we've already noted from Hebrews 13, 1 Peter 4, and Romans chapter 12. (laughs) Okay, so let that statement sink in a minute, right? Like 2 John 10 and 11 and 1 Corinthians 5 are exceptions that are given to a general rule that is to characterize Christians. And if you compare and contrast 2 John, with third John, you see that while second John is giving you a warning not to show hospitality to false teachers, and by the way, do some study on what a false teacher really is and and understand that what John is saying you shouldn't do is help to further the reach of a false teacher. All right. In third John, though, the issue is he's trying to encourage them to show hospitality to the right visitors, to the right people. So, Mm -hmm. you know, let that balance out a little bit. And, you know, this isn't always a great measuring stick, but the reality is if you're concerned about it, then the chances are you're not going to violate it. So move forward, do the right thing. And, you know, err on the side of love and hospitality. Uh, You know, give folks the benefit of the doubt and just do what you know you ought to do. The Good Samaritan, and yes, it's it's a story, right? Jesus made it up to illustrate a point. But when in this story that Jesus told, the Good Samaritan did not give the guy who had been left for dead a doctrinal questionnaire first before he re- before he you know was going to be willing to help the guy he saw a guy in need and he helped him and that's what we need to do as well so sometimes we just make excuses and again i think it mo- it's motivated out of a good place but let's just realize that those were divine exceptions in second john 10 and first corinthians 5 over against what is to be a general rule for christ's people Yeah. And I was going to say one more thing, Chance, and I know COVID may have, you know, enhanced this some, 
but we just are in a very individualistic culture right now. And because of that, and I, this, I think this was true before COVID, I think it's only been enhanced, mm -hmm. but like we sometimes live very far away from the building, even our close friends in the congregation sometimes haven't ever been to our homes. And we just kind of have this, I do me, you do you type of spirit. And we would even sometimes maybe reason to ourselves, like, nobody's mad about that. We're okay with that. It's not as if, you know, somebody's lacking. We're pretty much content with being separate, coming together for the bit at the building. And when we do, we're very close and knit, but that's not, Jesus knows what we need beyond what we even realize we need. Even if we feel like our relationships are strong, we really do know each other. Well, we just typically don't do that. Like in bigger cities, maybe there's this idea. We just don't do that in this congregation. We're not a small country church. That's just not us. It's like hospitality isn't a geographical thing where if you've got enough people in enough proximity, then you do it. You do it because you're showing love to each other and you need those relationships more than you might even realize. So I think a pushback against our culture needs to be this is what Christians do, even though you don't see this welcoming spirit in the world, because you work with people. You don't talk to them beyond the job. You just go your separate ways. You've got this cyber relationship with most people. But in the church is supposed to be deeper than that. And I think that's one of the things that gets in the way right now. Our culture says you've got your private life. I've got my private life. And occasionally those things intersect because we have a common interest, but never really purposefully. We don't go beyond, you know, we don't go to each other's house unless there's a special need to or a reason to because you don't let anybody in your business. And that's one of the problems. We hate for anybody to see us unplugged and not with our, you know, face on or whatever. Like we just kind of want to present ourselves in a certain light. And that keeps us from being real. And that's why I think we have some of the problems we do. Sometimes people struggle with things. We're like, nobody knew that. Well, if we've been doing life together, we might have. We might have known that a person was struggling to need help. But we're in a culture that says, uh, don't come too close or I'll let you in a little bit. But, you know, open the door and stand between the door. Don't come in here. That sort of idea. And I think that that hinders us. Yeah. Preachers can it, especially struggle with that. I don't have my face on. I don't want you to see me outside of my suit and tie pulpit yeah. kind of role. And preachers need to get over themselves if they feel like that. If you feel like you've got something that you're hiding, then that is a red flag. You know, you need to figure that out and get over that. Uh, that's that's not healthy. Yeah. And I think if, if we're opening our house and it's not picture perfect perfection every time and they see the laundry over here, right? It's just an, it's just an, an indication and evidence that our lives aren't that much different. Like your life has mess in it. My life has mess in it. And now we're trying to sort, sort through this and work through this together. And here's an opportunity for how we can, can share with one another and help one another through those difficulties. I guess uh, something else that might stand in the way is how busy we are. And that, that tends to, um, the influence of culture, um, schedules packed from top to bottom. So I, I don't have a night to, to fit you in to come to the house. So we've got to learn how to, to chisel our schedule and make room for interacting with other people and having uh, other Christians into our home and being hospitable. But also another barrier could be just, I've never seen this demonstrated. I've never done it before. So there's this newness to it. There's this uncertainty about it. What's it going to look like? And so we, we ask all of these questions up front as we're thinking about doing it, that kind of puts up some more barriers and we're like, yeah, that, I'd rather rather not. So we've, we've got to be willing to just bust through that wall uh, of, of newness and uncertainty and just do it and then build from there. Do what you can and, and build from there. Um, I think one way that we can encourage this in the congregation is that for us, we're preachers, so we can model it. And as we're modeling it, inviting other people to help us. And that, that's a, a cool thing about Abraham in Genesis 18, right? He's not the only one demonstrating hospitality there. He goes and he talks to his servant. He's like, hey, I need you to do this to help these strangers. And he goes and he talks to his wife. And he's like, hey, I need you to, to help me with this for these strangers. And so then he builds this team of, of people who are engaged in this work of hospitality. And so we can do the same thing as we're inviting other people into our home. It's, it's, it's training and teaching other people how to do that in their house too. I think another thing that can happen if, you know, as you said, we are preachers is uh, we need to talk about this more. We need to obviously model it, but we need to talk about it and we need to give. I have found that um, if if you offer ways of accomplishing something, even just in theory, for an example, you know, some every 
year churches do their budgets and they're they're saying we're going to increase this and people think oh well that's great or that's a huge increase how do we do that well if everybody just gave if every family gave three dollars more a week we would hit that oh well that's not that big a deal then so if you if you make it digestible yeah. for people and help them to see that it, it becomes easier like who like we get up and say you know what this year we want to try and, and encourage one another to be in one another's homes more what if you just decided that once every quarter this year you're going to have somebody over at your house like just go ahead and schedule it now and mark this day off that says hey i'm going to i'm going to have you over and here are some people i would like to do i would like to have over and give it to them in in easily digestible parts to where they don't have to do all the heavy lifting if we can present them with options i mean we do that in all different types of places. I mean, I have a financial advisor who does our retirement stuff. I, he could tell me plan for retirement and I'd be, thanks. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't know what I was doing, but when he says, Hey, here's safe money, here's aggressive money. Here's a bucket over here and a bucket over here and a bucket over here. Then I'm thinking, no, I can do that. And so if, if, if we make it digestible for people and help them to understand, we're not saying you're going to have a Bible study. I mean, hey, you're coming to my house. We're going to watch the Super Bowl. If it's a Saturday in, in uh, the fall, we're going to watch college football. Like it's going to be on in the background somewhere. Like just get together and be normal. Like, uh, I think that's It's easier will, for some of y'all than others of us. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I think that was an invitation from Robert for all of us to come to his house. Yeah, Pretty if much. you if you want abnormal, then absolutely. <laughs> I've already overstayed my welcome there for the Oh, year, please. So, so I, you know, I, I was thinking earlier I dogged on programs, so let me balance myself out on the other end of that. And, and because, you know, at Henderson, we've got a lot of families, and sometimes it's hard. And we live in a small town, so that's an advantage. I think it's easier in a small town. Mm -hmm. You know, when I preach in the Charlotte area and in the Charleston areas, Sometimes, you know, just like Hiram said earlier, geographically, people lived at opposite ends of the area. And so you're talking 30, 40, 45 minute drive from, you know, the northernmost part to the southern, uh, northernmost home to the southernmost home. That Throwing is. Throwing some traffic, you're two hours. Ex yeah, exactly. Or a random tarp that falls on a bridge. It <laughs> happened one time in Charleston. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, you know, it, stuff like that, it does make it challenging. So, we have somewhat of a program, but it's a program that basically just organizes things and says, okay, now you people go do it. Um, but it's connection groups and, you know, people say, Hey, I want to be on a connection group. And basically you're saying, I am interested in meeting people, you know, who worship with me, but that I don't always bump into, you know, I, I take my kids to their Sunday school classes. I go to my Sunday school class and then I go to the auditorium and I follow the same route every time. And other people follow different routes every time, you know, they enter through a different door. So I don't see those people quite so often. And so one of our ministers goes in and he says, okay, I'm going to pair these, these families together for this quarter or whatever. And you know, okay, now here you go. Here's y'all's contact information. This month, this family's in charge of me hosting the meeting. And this month, that family's in charge of hosting the meeting. You don't have to do it at your house. You can do it in the fellowship hall. It doesn't matter where you do it. Just get together and do something. doesn't matter what you do. You know, you can order pizza or you can cook. You can play games or you can just sit around and swap stories. You can watch the game together or you can, you know, go bowling. It doesn't matter what you do. You just get together and do something. And that helps to foster some of that from a leadership perspective. We're trying to create this kind of culture. It does that. But there's one other thing I'm thinking of, and it, this goes back to a, a friend that each of the four of us has uh, who happens to live here in Henderson now. And he's just a hospitable kind of guy. And he he shows that by going around and greeting everybody in the auditorium every time. And, you know, at first people were like, hey, what are you running for office or something? Like, why are you, why are you, why are you going around greeting? You're not an elder. You're not a deacon. You're not a preacher. Why are you doing this? And he's like, well, I just love people. And he does. That's right. And, you know, and what has happened is that's kind of rubbing off. So that's not a program. It, that's not even from an official church leader. It's just somebody who's doing it. And because he does it, other people are inspired to do it too. And it really is just that simple. <laughs> yep. I guess coming to dinner is another program that's a lot of people have used. It makes some people uncomfortable, the unknowing part, but 
it's another thing. You might want to look into it if somebody's listening, thinking about, you know, different things. Yeah, it's like the snowball effect. If you get one or two doing it and they do it consistently, it just it begins to build momentum on its own and and it incorporates other people into that that kind of culture and that kind of behavior. Mm hmm. Well, I appreciate very much you guys and our discussion of hospitality today. I think it's been a great conversation, really learned a lot, been encouraged. And so I'm planning to, to keep up hospitality on our, our end in Charleston and increase that in our family. Um, and appreciate Kelly and our boys and their willingness to open our home and, and to be in, involved in the lives of other people. And it has great benefits for us. So we're going to keep doing it. And how cool is it that your kids grow up? I think about that all the time. I, I grew up watching people in our home and our kids grow up understanding that, hey, we have people come through and they stay with us and we hang out. And what a cool experience for them to grow up with, to meet all kinds of people from all walks of life all over the world. It's just, it's just oh, fun. Yeah. And then when they see those people again, I mean, yeah. the smile, the size mm -hmm. of, of the smile and the love that's in, the, in their heart and on their face is awesome. Absolutely. And then sometimes we have to unteach our three-year-old the things that Brad taught them while he was staying with us <laughs> hey, at home. It and, is well, the that, goodest, that was the goodest library he had ever <laughs> seen. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Just yesterday, okay, two weeks later, we're like, don't say that. That's just what Brad says. Quit saying that. <laughs> it also has a chimney. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Robert, you also have to help us get over what Brad says to us. <laughs> That's true, true, true. This podcast is equal parts therapy and teaching. Okay. <laughs> and hey, so, a loose uh, cannon. Uh, check out thelightnetwork.tv. That's where you can find previous episodes of Four Preachers in a Podcast. Thank you to those of you who said, hey, where was your video last week? Well, on the last episode, we were all together at Freed, and it was hard to fit all four of us in one camera angled in the tight space that we had. So I'm sorry about that. The video and is Chance back. Broke the camera. Chance broke the camera. You know these things happen. So uh, anyway, thank you for your uh, for your concern about that. And then if you're listening to this chronologically or sequentially or however you put it, uh, we didn't have an episode last week, and that's because we're all preachers, and sometimes things come up, and Hiram has to go speak at something big time, and you know anyway, it's not four preachers in a podcast <laughs> if there are just three of us. So what does that say in German, Hiram? <laughs> yeah. We used to have a segment on late night at TLN called "What's That in German?" So I think Hiram is going to revive. <laughs> there that we for go. Four preachers oh, yeah. on a podcast. That'll be great. <laughs> Can't wait. Oh, Gary can tutor him in this. I forgot. Yeah, about this. that's right. If you're I wanting need help. useless phrases in German. <laughs> So anyway, uh, we're sorry we missed. That happens sometimes. We do our best to be consistent, and we're just proud that we've been consist as consistent as we have. Six episodes in, we're already doing better than I thought we would. So, uh, you know, the bar is pretty low. But, hey, every Friday, <laughs> thelightnetwork.tv or your favorite podcast partner, that's where you can find us. Hit the follow us or subscribe button in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, so you never miss an episode. And yes, yeah, subscribe on YouTube because you can see our lovely faces. You can see how we react non-verbally when Hiram talks about the green beans, and it's all good stuff. Sometimes we throw up things on the screen that are also useful, like Bible verses or other things. So check that out on YouTube. Search for Preachers in a Podcast or The Light Network, and you can find it there. The mailbag episode is coming up, uh, and so uh, you know, let us know what you're thinking. Mail, M-A-I-L, at thelightnetwork.tv is how you can get in touch with us. All right, uh, everybody, go check the expiration date on your canned goods. And until next time. And then donate them to church. Stay cool. Stay cool.